This is ZL6A, headquarters station of the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, with the official broadcast for May 2013. Tonight, presidential comment, headquarters news, a Masterton conference update, and on the international scene... Ham Radio joins other services in responding to tornadoes in the Great Plains, and an in-depth look at Hamvention 2013. Yes, that and more, on tonight's NZART official broadcast. Good evening, everyone. Presenting the broadcast, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF in Nelson. Top of the list, it's presidential comment. Here's our NZRT president, Vaughan Henderson, ZL1TGC. Vaughan? Thanks, Jim, and good evening, everyone. Well, there's only one week to go to our annual general meeting and conference in Masterton. As you will hear later in this broadcast, the Wairo Rapper Branch 46 Conference Committee has been working hard to make our Queen's Birthday gathering a success. I'm looking forward to meeting as many of you as possible over the weekend, and I'm sure we're going to have a great time. While on the subject of conference, we still don't have a venue for our conference next year. We depend very much on branches around the country hosting the annual conference, and of course finding the small team of volunteers to run it. I hope that when the call goes out at the AGM next Saturday for an offer to host next year's AGM and conference, that we will have a volunteer. If we don't get anyone willing to do this, then we may have to revert to a one-day event held at some central location, probably Wellington, in order to hold our annual general meeting. Please let me, your local councillor, or Debbie at headquarters know if your club is willing to host our 2014 conference. I'm sorry to have to report that the latest edition of Public Information Bulletin Number 46, better known as PIB 46, from Radio Spectrum Management has changed the rules relating to the issue of single letter call signs. This change came about without the usual consultation and I am told was introduced as a result of a number of complaints to RSM. Currently only 15% of the available single letter call signs are actually allocated so it seems strange that there have been complaints as there appears to be plenty of single-letter calls available. Previous negotiations had resulted in a situation whereby the holder of a single-letter call could, on application, roll it over for a further period of 12 months and so on. The new edition 14 of PIB 46 now requires a stand-down time of six months for the single-letter call signs before they can be reissued. In other words, you can only hold a single letter call for one 12 month period and then it has to be relinquished and can't be applied for again until the six month stand down time has elapsed. I'm well aware that most single letter calls are used for contests and held by keen contest groups who also have to get QSL cards printed at some personal cost. If after the six month stand down period some other amateur gets the call, what happens to the QSL cards? Where will they go? I recognise this is a huge retrograde step for our keen ZL contesters and both our ALO, Don Wallace, ZL2TLL, and I have discussed this with the RSM licensing manager, expressing our concerns at the retrograde change. Unfortunately, he's not willing to undo the change to PIB 46 and wants to leave the matter for a period of time to see how things work out. It is my intention that we will keep making representations to RSM over this matter until we can get it resolved. To conclude, there's one upcoming event I'd like to draw your attention to, Jamboree on the Air, or JOTA, which is always held on the third weekend in October. Give some thought to how your club can participate. It's not too soon to start talking to your local scout and guide groups about their plans to take part in JOTA and how it can help them. Thanks for listening, and back to you, Jim. Thank you, Vaughan, the president of NZART, Vaughan Henderson, ZL1TGC. Onwards to Upper Hutt now, and it's a very good evening to NZRT's business manager, Debbie Morgan, ZL2DL. Thanks, Jim, and good evening, everyone. We are now one week away from conference, so you have only a couple of days left to send me either your apologies for the AGM or branch voting statistics if you do not have a delegate attending.
please send them to me no later than Wednesday this coming week. Recently, two NZART examination supervisors were audited by a radio inspector in Auckland. Essentially, RSM have undertaken this in order to ensure both NZART procedures and RSM policy is workable and without anomalies. One very significant matter has been raised during this audit. This is in regard to residency status of candidates and amateurs born overseas applying for a ZL call sign. The PIB, or PIB 46, policy document produced by RSM was updated in May of this year. However, due to this audit, a further draft has been prepared and will become official shortly. In regard to residency status, the new policy is quite specific and reads as follows. Only natural persons who are New Zealand citizens or New Zealand residents may be granted a New Zealand General Amateur Operators Certificate, or GAOC. Any application not fulfilling this criterion must be referred to RSM Licensing Manager. An ARX must be satisfied that an applicant is a New Zealand citizen or a New Zealand resident. A New Zealand birth certificate or passport is sufficient to confirm citizenship. Otherwise, a candidate must produce a New Zealand resident permit. A copy of this resident permit must be uploaded in SMART. That's all from me, Jim. Back to you. And thank you, Debbie. Debbie Morgan, ZL2DL, our NZRT Business Manager. For a look now at amateur radio news on the international scene, we head to Florida's Treasure Coast and join the amateur radio news lines, Jim Davis, W2JKD. Several radio services, including broadcasters and hams, responded as several days of severe weather, including tornadoes, hit the central plains. Amateur radio news lines, Mark Abramovich, NT3V, is here with what we know so far. The pictures seen on cable and network news channels of the devastation in Oklahoma have been gut-wrenching, but emergency officials are saying the warnings and local broadcast coverage by radio and television probably saved hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. Amateur radio played a part in the initial hours after the tornado went through the community of Moore in the Oklahoma City area. Kevin O'Dell, N0IRW, is the American Radio Relay League section manager for Oklahoma. He tells Newsline in an interview that the real call-up came through the Amateur Radio Emergency Service for operators to assist the Red Cross chapter. We've had one specific request of Aries to assist with the Red Cross in communications between the chapter office and their feeding area down at the incident command post, and uh, we secured from that. Odell says the operation secured Wednesday night. I do know of a couple of instances where there have been some other folks that have been involved, not for any real length of time, but once Comel got their systems up and running, uh, everything was in pretty good shape. Odell, who lives about 75 miles north of the tornado-affected region of the state, says while the devastation is vast, it is confined to a narrow area, and that enabled emergency crews to keep police, fire, and emergency radios up and running and restore wireless service rapidly. What a lot of people don't understand is that this is a 17-mile long track, but it's only a couple of miles wide. You get outside of that, and and things work pretty well. So just the communication within that strip is the only thing that's been really questioned. Odell says the Oklahoma City Moore area has lots of experience dealing with tornadoes. This isn't their first rodeo. These people know what they're doing. They're very good at it. The communication systems, because of this and because of events that they've had in the past, especially the May 3rd, 1999 storm that went basically through a very similar part of, of Moore, you know, a lot of the communication systems have been hardened a whole lot and have also been decentralized so that the infrastructure issue isn't quite as big a deal as you would have in a much broader situation. Odell describes the people of Oklahoma as resilient, although he concedes there are a couple people who lost their homes in 1999 and on the same site in the most recent tornado. Odell says he wouldn't be surprised if some of them took this second hit as a divinely inspired message to move elsewhere. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Mark Abramovich, NT3V.
As this newscast is being prepared, rescue workers are still sifting through the rubble of the twisters that brought death and destruction to that area. Meantime, ham radio operators remain on alert in case that they are needed. The 2013 Dayton Hamvention will likely go down in the amateur radio history books as one of the best. And while it'll be a while before we know the actual number of those attending, all indicators say it was again a banner year, Amateur Radio Newsline's Stephen Kinford, N8WB, reports. It was rather foggy on Friday, May 17th, when the doors opened at the Hare Arena for the 2013 Dayton Hamvention. But the gloom outside was quickly replaced by crowds of hams inside the showplace, ready for three days of ham radio fun. One of these was Hollywood producer Dave Bell, W6AQ. So the first thing I do is down the ramp to uh, deposit my ticket stub, my winning ticket stub, which is never, ever won, and then on into the main arena, which I call the snake pit because it is always full. And this Friday morning, it was even fuller than usual. Uh, I mean, it was packed. I turned around and went out the uh, way I came in and into a relatively empty hallway to go around to where the rest of the merchants were. And it was busy over there, too. I think the merchants must have done a gangbusters business this time. According to several longtime attendees, numbers appeared good for an opening day, as it's been the past two or three years. The ARRL reports that its expo area drew a substantial crowd with popular activities such as the W1AW 75th anniversary exhibit, the youth lounge, and spectral purity testing provided courtesy of the ARRL lab. And as usual, lines formed immediately for DXCC card checking. There were several new products introduced at Hamvention 2013, and while we do not have time this week to cover all of them, perhaps one of the most interesting was Yezu's new high-frequency transceiver. Tim Factor, KT7F of Yezu, described the new entry. We've come out with a very new um, HF rig, which is called the FTDX1200, which is um, a entry-level TFT screen radio that uh, uh, last year you may remember we were your viewers may remember, we came out with the FTDX 3000, which was an opportunity for uh, those who like the 5000 to have a price point a little less. So this year we just topped that with now an entry-level uh, TFT screen with a built-in band scope and um, the kind of features that you would find on the higher price range. Not to be outdone, ICOM was there with two new products. The company showcased both its ID51A portable and IC7100 mobile radios. Both are D-Star ready, and as such, they facilitate clear digital voice, short data messages, worldwide D-Star linked repeater access over the Internet, and more. The IC7100 is particularly of interest in that it combines VHF and UHF analog and digital with all-band, all-mode mobile operations using a new slanted control head with what is the amateur industry's first touch screen interface. This is the radio many saw previewed on the Ham Nation Internet TV show a few months ago. There's lots more to tell you about Hamvention 2013, but that's all the time we have right now. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Stephen Kinford, NAWB in Ham Radio City, USA. For now, with Bill Pasternak, WA6 ITF at our editor's desk, I'm Jim Davis, W2JKD saying 73 from Florida's Treasure Coast, and we thank you for listening. Amateur Radio Newsline is copyright 2013. All rights are reserved. Thank you, Jim. And as always, we say thank you to Newsline for the use of their copyright material. The NZRT National Conference this year is being held in Masterton next weekend and hosted by the Wirepper Amateur Radio Club, Branch 46 NZART. Here's David Braze at L2BA, the conference committee chairman, with his final update. Hi all. Well, it's less than a week to go to conference Masterton. A rush of registrations have been coming in over the last few days, but there is still time to register if you wish to attend the conference, and the easiest way is through our online special website at www.nzartconference2013.co.nz. Just a reminder that the registration form printed in the latest break-in does not show an option for the dinner only on Saturday night. Please add this to your form if required. Registrations will take place from 3pm until 9pm on Friday evening in the foyer of the Copthorne Hotel. The registration desk will open again at 8am on Saturday morning, ready for the AGM commencing at 9am. The raffles are already selling, so if you can't make it to conference and wish to purchase one of the raffles, 
for the ICOM IC7200 HF radio, the Yaesu FT1900 VHF mobile base set, or the Bofang VHF UHF handheld, your conference delegate may be able to grab one or two for you. Don't forget, a car boot sale will be held on Sunday morning before the conference activity starts. I look forward to seeing you all next weekend in Masterton. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, David. David Bray, ZL2BA, reporting for the Masterton Conference Committee. Well, it's time for Waro News, and it's a very good evening to Rosemary, ZL1RO. Thanks, Jim, and hello, everyone. The Waro Annual General Meeting will take place at the Copthorne Hotel, Masterton, on Sunday, June the 2nd, starting at 8.30am sharp. We hope there'll be a good turnout of members at our AGM. The early start enables members to get away to other events later in the morning. Waro President Margaret said our 1MB is hoping for a good attendance of members at the AGM. If you're unable to attend, apologies can be emailed to myself or to any Waro executive member. Bulletin editor Bev said our 1OS would welcome written articles and especially photos depicting Waro members' participation at conference for the next Bulletin magazine. Waro YOLs who are unable to get to conference are generally interested to read about the alternative program and I hope that someone will find the time to write a few lines about their experiences. Remember too that contributions are needed for the Waro page in Breakin. Any items of interest, no matter how small, are very welcome. Items for the Breakin page should be sent to waro at nzart.org.nz. If you took part in the recent Thelma Super Memorial Contest, contacts made then can be counted towards some Waro awards. Check through your log and you might find you have enough contacts to qualify for a certificate or an additional sticker to an existing award. Awards custodian Lynette said all one ll would welcome more applications for Waro awards. That's all from Waro for May, Jim. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Rosemary. Reporting for Waro, Rosemary Bosher, ZL1RO. Finally, in tonight's official broadcast lineup, it's Branch News. Here's Stephen McNeil, ZL4HG. Thanks, Jim, and good evening, everyone. We start tonight from the Gisborne Amateur Radio Club, Branch 11 ends at ART. The next meeting will be held at the Scout Hall on Monday, the 10th of June, starting 7:30 p.m. NZART Councillor Warren Harris from the Hawkes Bay will attend. All welcome, of course. The Hutt Valley Branch 18 ends at ART has its next meeting on Monday, June the 10th, starting 7.30pm at the club rooms in Philip Evans Reserve in Waterloo. Note that this will be the branch's annual general meeting. Branch 26 Nelson has its next meeting on Wednesday, June the 19th. Note that the meeting will be held at the supper room on the Nelson city side of the Stoke Memorial Hall on 548 Main Road in Stoke. The club's NZART delegate will give a report on the NZART conference, and Stuart Robinson, ZL2STR, will give a talk and demonstration of his screwdriver antenna. And finally, Christchurch West Amateur Radio Club, Branch 56 NZART, has its next meeting on Tuesday the 28th of May. Phil, ZL3PAH, will talk about and demonstrate two popular free PC locking programs which are in general use in New Zealand. Logger 32 and N1MM. And looking forward to 25th of June, there will be a report on NZART conference as well as another talk. Visitors and guests are most welcome. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen McNeil, ZL4HG, reporting from Christchurch. The next issue of NZART's headquarters info line will be emailed on Friday the 7th of June. Remember, you can subscribe for your copy of this Bulletin of News from NZRT Headquarters on the NZRT webpage at www.nzart.org.nz. The next official broadcast of NZART will be the special conference broadcast made by ZL2OA at 8pm only next Sunday night, the 2nd of June. The conference broadcast will be available for replay as an MP3 file on the NZART webpage from Tuesday the 4th of June. This is at L6A, headquarters station of the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, concluding the NZART official broadcast 
for May 2013. Good night, everyone. Good night now.